is a KETV News Watch 7 breaking news update. We're stepping away from the presidential news conference for local breaking news. Good morning. I'm John Oki. And I'm Alex Hoffman. The Nebraska Medical Center is about to update us on what is next for Dr. Rick Sacra. The Massachusetts doctor arrived at the Nebraska Medical Center just before dawn this morning to be treated for Ebola. And here's that very room where that news conference is about to begin. We are on standby, of course, waiting for that to happen. This is the same room where Nebraska Medical Center doctors first briefed us about this entire situation on Thursday. We'll hear from leaders of Dr. Saker's mission. SIMUSA is expected the team at Nebraska Medical Center will treat Dr. Saker for at least a week inside NMC's special biocontainment patient care unit. Uh, the doctor became infected with Ebola while working on a mission in Liberia. A special plane brought him to Omaha overnight, landing around uh, six, 6 o'clock this morning. Dr. Saker's family is expected here in Omaha sometime later today. They'll be able to visit with him over a video phone system in the biocontainment unit. This is a video we had of you from uh, this morning during First News. And then the, the doctor uh, arrived at the Nebraska Medical Center this morning in an Omaha rescue squad, part of this caravan that brought the doctor from Offutt Air Force Base to the hospital. And Omaha police, Bellevue police, and the Nebraska State Patrol escorted the rescue squad. The state patrol also flew in overhead its helicopter. Let's send it uh, straight to that news conference now where they are just about to begin. Up, one of our infectious disease specialists who has been up in the biocontainment unit, at least on the floor, and has been uh, corresponding with some of the doctors. Doctor Up. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. Um, so my name is Mark Rupp. I'm a division chief of our infectious disease division here, and I'm our director of our infection control department. I'm uh, very pleased to relate a brief update on our patient uh, that was transferred successfully from West Africa early this morning. Uh, the transfer really went very, very smoothly, and the patient is up in our biocontainment unit. Uh, our patient is sick but uh, stable, and we're uh, taking appropriate care of this patient, which we will continue to do so. Um, our unit is uh, specially designed um, exactly for this type of uh, patient and for this purpose. It's a very safe environment uh, for the patient as well as for our healthcare providers and the rest of our patients. I would, however, emphasize that we are taking this as added precaution and really um, contact isolation precautions uh, would suffice for caring for this type of patient. Um, we know Ebola is a dangerous virus, but it's not particularly contagious. It's not spread via an airborne route, but it's spread by direct contact with blood and body fluids. And so we're taking uh, all appropriate precautions to make sure that we care for this patient safely. Let's move on to uh, Rosanna Morris, who is our, our chief nursing officer at the Nebraska Medical Center, also chief operating officer, also a nurse. So she can provide uh, things from that perspective. Rosanna. Good morning. I just want to express on behalf of the Nebraska Medical Center our deepest appreciation and gratitude to not only all of our colleagues, our clinicians, our staff, our nurses who have really stepped up to the plate, have embraced the opportunity to care for this remarkable patient who is doing remarkable things. It is our goal to provide the finest and highest quality care and support this individual to a uh, successful uh, recovery is our hope. Um, we have received much feedback, commentary, and overwhelming support from our community, um, both locally, regionally, and nationally, internationally. Folks from everywhere are just commenting and uh, really, I think, praying for this individual and providing support in many different ways. We want to acknowledge those efforts and express, again, our gratitude to them. Thank you. Thanks, Rosanna. We also have Dr. Ali Khan, who is the Dean of College of Public Health here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Good morning, everybody. I'm the new Dean of the College of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And I just recently retired from CDC and as an assistant surgeon general, so I was asked to help represent the university this morning. Uh, let me say a couple of prepared comments first. Uh, so our number one priority, needless to say, is to provide extraordinary care to this Ebola-affected patient and to protect our healthcare workers and our community. I think it's important to remember that Ebola does not present a public health threat to the United States. However, this uh, Ebola case at the University of Nebraska Medical Center uh, really makes the point that Ebola and other global infections are local issues and not just global issues. 
and this isn't necessarily because people would be sent here to the University of Nebraska Medical Center for exceptional care, but because of airline travel and the possibility that somebody may show up at any hospital here within not just the United States, but worldwide. And we've already been seeing that happen in West Africa. The point being that the longer the current outbreak goes on, it's really inevitable that we will continue to see additional spread worldwide and why it's so important to really shut down this outbreak as soon as uh, possible. And all of you are quite familiar with this uh, um, happening. We saw this with MERS cases, for example, in the United States just very recently. So these diseases, global diseases, present local issues to us here in Nebraska and in the United States. Now, as you just heard Dr. Mark Rupp say, with meticulous infection control, Ebola patients can be treated in any healthcare facility in the United States. That said, we're really honored to be chosen to provide extraordinary care to this patient, not just because of this extra layer of protection with our biocontainment facility, but because of our dedicated, trained, and really exemplary hospital staff uh, who understand what it means to do serious medicine. Now, as a leading academic medical center here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, I can say three things. We're confident in our dedicated staff. We'll be transparent with all of our actions with our community, and we are going to share the lessons we learned from this patient with the global community. As I've heard and as you'll hear again and again, we have an amazing staff of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals here who have really been planning for years for this specific scenario. And they've carefully thought through all the critical issues around case management and around safety. Now, because I know you will ask, we have great linkages. Our clinicians and treating physicians have great linkages with Emory and other global physicians uh, who have been very generous in sharing their knowledge with us. And this transfer of knowledge is really important. And we hope that the current efforts here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center will really continue to build our global capacity for how to treat these types of patients and prepare all countries to be better able to respond for subsequent cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. We'll now move to the folks with SIM USA. We have Bruce Johnson, who is the uh, president of SIM USA. Great, thank you. And also with me is Will Elphick. Uh, Will is the SIM country director for Liberia. Uh, let me just uh, start first. Uh, Will and I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Rupp, Dr. Ali Khan, and uh, Ms. Morris for uh, your dedication. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ali Khan, um, to me this is an example of uh, God's provision. He's been following Ebola around the world, studying it uh, for literally decades, and to be able to have him here uh, at, uh, at this medical center is phenomenal. So thank you so much for your staff, your uh, medical professionals here. Uh, their level of cooperation and commitment for Dr. Rick Sacra and his family, and frankly, just your Midwestern hospitality has, uh, has really been uh, shown, been encouraging, and very much appreciated. On behalf of uh, Dr. Sacra's dear wife, Debbie, and their three sons, and the global community of SIM, I want to thank everyone who has had a part in this. This has all happened so quickly that Debbie is making arrangements uh, for her family and will arrive uh, here in Omaha this weekend to be reunited with Rick. Of course, she would appreciate uh, her privacy during these coming days. Uh, for SIM and uh, particularly for Will and myself, the speed and effort to bring Rick back to the United States for his continued treatment of this Ebola virus has frankly been astounding to us. Two days ago, at, the pre at our press conference in Charlotte, this was an option. Today, Rick's in Omaha. Those involved uh, extend to the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Embassy uh, staff there in Liberia, uh, to the, uh, of course, Nebraska Medical Center, our wonderful staff, SIM and ELWA medical personnel in Liberia, uh, extended to the evacuation airplane, the crew, the medical staff that were on that, uh, even as I saw this morning, uh, off at Air Force Base, to the Omaha Police and Public Safety, to the uh, Nebraska Public Health Authorities, 
and to the Monrovia Liberia uh, airport manager and his staff. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people that I haven't mentioned, but our gratitude uh, really goes out to everyone. The logistics and complexity of this operation were phenomenal. And we want to praise God that it came together so quickly and so seamlessly. Rick would actually be somewhat embarrassed by all of this attention. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a humble man. And uh, when Will and I received this email from Rick Monday morning that his temperature had risen, here's what he wrote. To all of you at SIM and to my colleagues here in Liberia at Elwa Hospital, I apologize. You know, you see, Rick didn't want this to detract or disrupt any of the care of the patients at our Elwa Hospital in Monrovia. You know, he, he wanted them to continue to care for the people there in Liberia. Rick went on to say, regarding evacuation, I know and accept that there is no easy solution for an evacuation, so I don't expect one. Jesus is right here with me in Liberia. And Dr. Brown, our SIM Elwa medical director, who's Liberian, has a lot of experience now. And the Elwa 2 unit has been discharging a lot of alive patients. I know that, I know that with or without evacuation, I could well die from this disease. And frankly, my main concern are for Debbie and my boys and the ministry of SIM and how that would affect things. I can only trust that God is at work." Unquote. This morning I had an experience at the hotel just before coming over here. I was having breakfast and the person serving me asked me if I was here for meetings and I said, well, I'm, I'm actually here for the Ebola patient. I happen to be the president of SIM USA. He came back 10 minutes later and he said, I've just activated a, uh, a prayer chain across three states in the Midwest that are praying for Dr. Sacra. Indeed, God is at work. Will and I and the doctors would be glad to take your questions. If, if I could, is it possible, and I, I know HIPAA regulations and all that, but you've given some, could you give us a little more on Dr. Sacra's condition? Exactly sort of what the symptoms are? Or, how he is on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of his condition. Yeah, so I'm really not at liberty to share any uh, specific details. What I can tell you is that uh, he did arrive uh, uh, safely, that we're doing, um, you know, our basic checks on him right now with getting some of our baseline laboratories, making sure that his fluid status is uh, equilibrated, that his electrolytes are in control, uh, those sorts of things. And I really can't share details on that. I'm sorry. Uh, we know that he's um, seriously ill with a virus that has a, a fairly high mortality rate associated with it. Uh, like I said, we will continue to care for him with very aggressive uh, supportive care, and we're looking into alternatives for some of our uh, experimental therapeutics right now. Doctor, if I could, uh, what is the toughest part of this treatment? What is the thing that concerns you most about a patient like him if you can't specifically comment on his condition? Well, the thing that um, concerns all of us the most is we have no specific therapeutic modalities to treat this virus. And so uh, we're going to be using aggressive supportive care to support his uh, organ systems, uh, fluids, electrolytes, uh, et cetera. Uh, we'll try to make sure that there's nothing else going on with him. And then we will be exploring our options to see what sort of experimental ther therapeutics are available. And uh, we'll be looking at those and trying to figure out which uh, one is the most promising and potentially using that uh, for our patient. Can you tell us what your options are on that? Well, there's a, a number of uh, things that are being considered. Um, there's the possibility that we could use uh, passive immunity, so taking uh, uh, antisera or immune globin preparation from a uh, surviving patient and potentially uh, using that. Uh, there are some experimental therapeutics that have been uh, devised that uh, try to uh, trick the virus, if you will, 
um, a sort of a, a interfering RNA molecule that's uh, in development. Uh, there's also uh, uh, nucleoside analogs that are in development. All of these have not been used uh, in humans. Uh, there is some promising data in animal models and primates. So we're going to look at that. We're talking to experts uh, uh, around the country uh, that have started to do some of this work. And we'll be uh, trying to figure out if, if this provides a, uh, an option for our patient. When do you have to make that decision? We'll be making that as quickly as we can. Dr. Kong, um, you talked about you expect more patients. Any projections as to how many um, Ebola patients will be coming to America? No, we, we can't make those projections. I think the bigger point is that... Are we good? Yeah. Perfect. I think the real issue is not projection on cases here in America. It's how do we stop the outbreak in Africa and how do we scale up what needs to get done projection to stop the outbreak. Africa, how many, how many Any projections? No way, to make, no way to make a projection. What's clear is the outbreak is complex, difficult, and cases are increasing. So we need to respond. And how does the outbreak stop? Does it just stop through people just avoiding other people with Ebola and it just sort of dies, dies off? I mean, is there a way to stop this? Absolutely. There's nothing new about this outbreak. The, the outbreak currently is a lot more complex than previous outbreaks given where it's occurring. It's occurring in a place that's never had an outbreak before, so the medical community and the community aren't very familiar with Ebola. It's occurring in a complex set of very urban areas and extremely rural areas. Um, and it's occurring in a place that really has a devastated health system and public health system. And you compound that with the fact that there's really a lack of trust but often between the community and healthcare providers, which is, uh, and the inability to stop the outbreak to the current date. And this has really been exacerbated by years of lack of attention to health, health issues. Uh, so there's, and that's led to violence and other issues. So that's why this complex, this outbreak is a little bit, or in many ways, very different from previous outbreaks, why it's the largest outbreak ever reported. I think this is the most deaths that have ever been reported. However, the disease is the same, and how to get this outbreak in control is the same. It's about good public health measures, case identification, isolation, health uh, communications, uh, good infection control within healthcare settings. So they need to stop trans transmission within hospitals, they need to find every patient, they need to track every contact. Dr. Saber wasn't even treating Ebola patients, is that right? He was serious uh, doctor treating uh, pregnancy. Yeah, I'd be glad to answer that. Yes, uh, he uh, was treating obstetrics, so he was uh, giving birth, you know, helping women through C-sections, uh, so forth, so he wasn't treating Ebola patients. Uh, we're working with the CDC, who's on the ground in Monrovia. We've been cooperating with them over the last two months. Uh, for SIM, we would actually like to know what is that contact point. Because, as Dr. Khan has said, when we know that contact point, then we can inform others so that we better understand the situation. So we have no confirmation on the contact point. Dr. Rupp, uh, in terms of getting what does, uh, what does the progression of symptoms look like if the patient is able to make a full recovery? Well, we would uh, anticipate a course uh, similar to what our colleagues saw at uh, Emory, that uh, we know we're in for a long haul. This might be a, a two or three week period of time that our patient goes through a convalescent uh, period of time. Um, we know the natural history of Ebola virus. Um, you know, again, the incubation period being somewhere in the neighborhood of from the shortest time of two days maybe to as long as three weeks. Uh, folks come down with a constellation of symptoms consisting of fevers, headaches, nausea, vomiting, muscle aches, more or less a, a very severe flu-like illness. In the worst situations, they uh, then have superimposed hemorrhagic symptoms where they start to bleed from the GI tract, et cetera. Uh, we're not seeing that in our patient currently. Uh, we'll be monitoring closely and supporting as uh, aggressively as we can. Both of the other two patients made what I think most people looking at us from the outside would see as remarkable recoveries heard about this particular disease. What have you learned from those two cases that you can apply now uh, that you think might make the difference? And I, are you optimistic about recovery at this point? Well, um, I think you can look at the, uh, the data coming from West Africa where the mortality has been somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% or so. Um, that's in, as has already been related, fairly 
uh, primitive um, supportive conditions uh, by our own standards. So these aren't hospitals that have uh, ICU capacity and some of the capabilities that we have here in the United States. Uh, we would think with that supportive ther therapy that our patient has at least a good, if not much better, chance of survival. Are, are you optimistic about a full recovery at this point, given the um, right now, I think we'll have to withhold uh, comments on that. Obviously, he has a very serious infection. Uh, we know that this can be associated with mortality. Uh, we're going to very aggressively support this patient and hope for the best. Doctor, can you talk a little bit about the number of people that are in a room at any point in time with him, the type of specialties they have, whether it's nurses? Sure. So as, as previously was mentioned, uh, this unit has been uh, in existence for almost a decade. Uh, so we've been planning for this day uh, for a long time, being very careful and, and very meticulous uh, in that planning. We've been having drills on a quarterly basis for years. Uh, in recent months, we've obviously been stepping that up, thinking that uh, this eventuality might occur. So uh, this is a unit that's constructed, it's secure, it's separated from the rest of the hospital, it has a separate air handling system. Uh, the air is uh, of negative pressure, so all the air is um, withdrawn back into the room. It doesn't escape back out of the unit. It's passed through a HEPA filter and exhausted outside. There's no recirculation of air. We have an autoclave within the unit, so any medical generated waste would be autoclave before it would come out of this unit. There's a dunk tank that's filled with antiseptic so that if there's a laboratory test that needs to be done, we can actually take the vial and disinfect it as it uh, comes out of, the, out of the unit. So it's a very, very well thought out process. Uh, as far as the training that's been uh, uh, done, as has already been mentioned, um, folks have gone through a rigorous training procedure. Uh, we work with sort of a buddy system so that there's a person that helps another person put on their isolation garb very carefully, making sure that we're meticulous, that we don't miss any steps. And likewise, when they come out of isolation, the person's there to help them uh, take off their garb and make sure that it is uh, done safely. Uh, we have uh, both an antiseptic shower as well as a, just a sanitary shower for people coming off of the unit. So every measure is being done to take care of this patient uh, with the greatest amount of safety for our healthcare providers. Again, we think this is above and beyond what is probably required. Um, as Dr. Khan has related, it's, it's fairly likely that we will see patients coming from uh, endemic areas of the world and presenting with febrile illness, uh, whether we know it's Ebola or not. In our situation, we know it's Ebola, and therefore it makes it a much safer environment. Uh, when it's a, a febrile illness of unknown etiology, uh, this is where it gets a little bit more tricky, and obviously hospitals all over the country are thinking through this eventuality and making plans for it. I'm in close contact and communication with my colleagues all over the country, and every major hospital in, this, in, the, in the U.S. is thinking of plans of how to safely deal with this kind of patient. Again, when we know it's an Ebola patient, we have this unit, it makes great sense for us to be using it. Uh, this truly is our mission to take care of sick patients. It's also our mission to learn from this patient. And so that's why it's great to be in this environment at a university medical system where we can be looking for the best ways and the safest ways of caring for this patient. So everything's being done uh, very methodically, very carefully in a safe manner. And um, I think this is exactly the right place for this patient to be. I think Dr. Russ Morris, in regards to the community, you mentioned the community, community reaction that found out that Dr. Sake was being brought here. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? What have you been hearing from the public? That obviously, in Atlanta, there was that concern that why are they bringing those patients here? So I think, uh, first and foremost, we needed to communicate internally. And that was amongst our leaders, amongst our staff, and then our patients that were actually in the hospital yesterday afternoon that uh, the information was already becoming quite public and we wanted to make sure that we were very proactive about communicating what was happening and, and reassuring um, folks and answering any questions that, that came up. So that was our first sort of touch point, if you will, in terms of how the reaction or um, any feedback that we were receiving and across the board uh, comments like, of course, this patient would come here. Um, definitely, we can not only provide this level of care, but outstanding care to meet this patient's needs. Um, so that was the internal feedback. Um, I also want to give a thanks to Emory because related to communication and feedback and what could you anticipate both positively and any concerns, they shared some best practices that they had identified, um, particularly with their patients and families that were within the hospital setting.
Um, so we also have um, our internet sites and so we're receiving a lot of posts and blogs related to that and our, our uh, fabulous media folks are monitoring that information very closely and again the outpouring has been you know uh, we're here to support we think what you're doing is great um, we understand that there are always going to be concerns um, but we're, we're appreciative of the feedback that we've received thus far. Related question we're being asked, and Dr. Shea touched on this briefly last evening, is why here in Nebraska as opposed to sending Dr. Sacra to Emory? And can you talk about the government's involvement in that decision? Sure. So we were requested by the Department of State to uh, care for this patient. This was uh, passed through the various uh, mechanisms and uh, uh, was uh, agreed upon by our own state health department. And I think the rationale is, is actually very sound. As we've already related, this is going to be a big outbreak in Africa. It's going to go on for some time before we get control over it. Uh, there are going to be patients that show up on our doorsteps uh, either with known or perhaps having uh, Ebola. And so it makes sense to try to uh, improve our infrastructure structure for caring for these types of patients, um, making sure that we have centers of excellence that uh, we learn from. And so, uh, you know, again, building our ability to care for these folks by using the various units that we have at our disposal makes great sense. And uh, from that experience, um, translating into practice in other settings throughout the country. So again, it's very likely that other hospitals will see these types of patients eventually. And uh, we, we plan on learning from our patient, passing on those best uh, care experiences to them. Well, I, th I think, it, yes, it's uh, partly to, to make sure that these uh, units are um, uh, functioning like they're supposed to and uh, learning and, um, uh, again, not overwhelming the uh, capability in any one place. Uh, so, again, this is something that I think we're in for uh, perhaps a longer haul than we may have initially thought about, and it probably will go for some time. Dr. Well, talk about the, uh, the virus itself. You say you can only catch it if you if you've been in contact. But what kind of life expectancy, if any, does a virus have if it gets on, like, the ambulance that transported him here or the, the suits that the medical staff is wearing or any medical equipment? Does it have any life expectancy after that? Is there a possible way that it can be spread other than just human-to-human -human contact? So these uh, things have been considered very carefully. Uh, obviously, we thought about this as we transported this patient here, so they're um, in a special transport uh, vehicle with special precautions being taken and very aggressive disinfection practices uh, being taken. Uh, this virus is not particularly um, resistant to known antiseptics and disinfectants. So ver very much the routine disinfectants can be used and will uh, inactivate this virus. It's also not particularly environmentally hardy. So in other words, if it's out there in the environment, it fairly quickly dies due to sunlight and drying. So it's not a virus that is um, particularly contagious or infectious. Again, as we've already stated, it's spread by direct contact with blood and body fluids. It's not air, uh, airborne and not floating around the air that we're going to inhale. So uh, we feel very, very confident that we can care for this patient safely with the precautions that are in place. Um, and we are obviously taking a very, very special care with our disinfection practices, with our um, sterilization practices. Mr. Johnson, um, Dr. Saker is the second of your medical missionaries to contract Ebola. Uh, what precautions are your folks taking in the field and how concerned are you in sending people out and keeping people out in the, in the areas where the Ebola is? Yeah, well, we continue to uh, put into practice uh, guidelines uh, established by CDC and actually exceeding those. So we want to continue to do that. Uh, we want to continue to learn just as the Nebraska Medical Center wants to continue to learn. We want to continue to learn to be able to provide good practice. Um, you know, what's interesting is when Rick uh, be became infected, and we had confirmation on that uh, just this last Monday, uh, one of our SIM doctors uh, left within 24 hours to go to uh, Monrovia, Liberia to both care for Rick uh, check on him. We didn't realize that he would be evacuated so quickly and then continue our care in our hospital. So, um, yeah, we're, uh, and that doctor, uh, you know, again, knows uh, the situation, knows the protocols, and uh, was willing to go in, and we were willing to have him go back in. We have, I'm, I'm sorry, we have some folks listening in on the phone. Do you want to finish that? 
Uh, we have two uh, SIM personnel in the field in terms of from, from other countries other than Liberia, but we have 250 staff workers at ELWA. Not all of them work at the hospital, uh, but many of them work at the, the radio station at the school uh, and just keeping the generators and the water running uh, because there's no grid there that can actually help to run the hospital, so we have to do that all ourselves. But there's many, many Liberian staff that are doing a wonderful job uh, not only in the hospital, but also in uh, the two Ebola case management centers uh, that are there on the Elwood campus. There's one that has uh, 43 patients about three days ago, that's Elwood 2, and at Elwood 3, which is run by Doctors Without Borders and the Liberian government, that has 120 beds and maybe need to be increased uh, to around 200. So uh, I just want to confirm what Dr. Khan is saying, that this disease is somewhat out of control. But there is opportunities with good healthcare measures uh, to bring it under control. Okay, and before we go to the folks who are listening on the phone to see if they have any questions, we had one more question back, back here, and then we'll come back after the phone questions. The patient was transported from the uh, plane to the ambulance and into the entrance via gurney. Okay, but we have some folks listening in on the phone, I think. If we would like to field any questions from those folks, uh, fire away. Uh, hi, this is Julie Steenheisen calling from Reuters. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, what I'm wondering is if you can tell us who is paying for the transportation and for the care of these patients? Is this something that is uh, handled by SIM or is this uh, the government or the hospital is, you know, just, just curious about that part, part please. Yeah, SIM uh, is assuming the financial responsibility uh, for the evacuation. Uh, we're trusting that uh, our good medical insurance <laughs> will be able to uh, provide the reimbursement for the medical center as well as uh, we're exploring our evacuation insurance uh, to see if that's provided. All of our missionaries that go around the world, we send people from over 50 countries to all five continents and uh, those individuals have evacuation insurance for this kind of situation. To elaborate on that, uh, I remarked this morning to you that you're getting pretty adept at these evacuations, which is both good but also shows the level of risk that your medical personnel face when they go to countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, or other places. And you said that you're assuming the financial risk here. It, is there a point, Bruce, where the liability becomes so great, not just from an economic standpoint, from a, but from a personal risk standpoint? where you have to rethink having American medical missionaries in West Africa. I'm going to ask uh, Will. Uh, I sensed he had a response to that. Yes. Um, yeah, we, when our, our missionaries were evacuated, we, we evacuated a lot of um, non-essential personnel out of that. And then we've had meetings to actually assess the risk of people going back in there. And uh, we're always continually looking at that. But one of the things I would say is, you know, firefighters, when they have a fire there, they assess the risk. You know, there's a, somebody in a building, a burning building. Do they go in and rescue that person? Now, they've taken all the precautions they can to minimize that risk. And that's what we need to do if we've got medical staff going in there to minimize the, the risk that people take. There's always going to be some situations where you've done all that you can to mitigate against those, but something unexpected happens and this is where we need to learn uh, about those risks of unexpected, and, and as has been said, this is totally different in terms of the context of this disease happening in West Africa to other outbreaks. But we do uh, assess the risks and we talk with individuals about going in and the risks that they are taking. There may come a point in the future where we say, well, we can't actually uh, take the risk of other people going in there. But our heart, is with the Liberian people, with people who are uh, needing the health care and who are dying from this disease. And we need to ramp up the international response to uh, the, the Ebola crisis that is happening in Liberia and in, in the rest of West Africa. We can't just stand by and do nothing in that. Do you know what that point is? I can't say at the moment what that point is. Uh, we assess it continually. 
uh, as to what that point is, uh, but I can't say at the moment what it is. Before we field any more questions, do we have any more questions on the phone? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the gentleman who spoke first, go ahead. Hi. Hi, this is Kevin Stewart with WAGA Television in Atlanta. I was curious, what were the most important uh, elements that were learned uh, from Emory University that they've shared with you? And is there anything that you learned that you will do differently? Well, as uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, we have been in close contact with our uh, colleagues at Emory. They uh, were very forthcoming with uh, sharing their experience. Uh, they talked a little bit about some of the practicalities of uh, using some of the isolation gear and uh, how to do that more effectively and efficiently. Uh, we've taken those uh, uh, things in advisement and are uh, looking at our own practices here. Uh, so I think those are the types of, um, you know, perhaps uh, everyday mundane sort of tips that uh, sometimes are, are the most valuable. And we've clearly, um, you know, been listening uh, very, very closely and, and trying to mirror our practices uh, to, to make use of their experience. No, there, there uh, were no surprises to the best of my knowledge. We had one more question. Excuse me. Go ahead, Brian. Finish that one. Yeah, I can't really share um, specific details on the, uh, the uh, you know, condition of the patient. Uh, suffice it to say that, again, the transfer went very smoothly. Patients in our unit, uh, we're evaluating them, getting baseline measures right now and, and stabilizing. I'm, I'm not going to be able to share specific uh, details on his condition. I'm sorry. I think we had at least one more question on the phone. Hi. Can you hear me? This is Carrie Sheridan from AFP. Uh, absolutely. Go ahead, Carrie. Okay, thanks. I was wondering if you could tell us anything more about the latest on the hospital where the doctor got Ebola. Were there any other patients there in the obstetric ward who had Ebola or, you know, how is that being tracked and what's the latest on that? Yeah, I'll respond to that. Uh, no, we don't have any other patients in the hospital uh, that have Ebola in the actual hospital where they're treating obstetrics patients and we're hoping to treat uh, pediatric patients. But there are uh, many patients in the Ebola case management uh, units. Uh, as I've mentioned before, we had about 40, 43 patients the, just a couple of days ago in one of the units and uh, up to 120 in the other units. But no Ebola patients actually in ELWA hospital. One of the issues that we're facing is that many of the hospitals in Liberia have closed down. Many of the staff are not there. They're fearful about coming into work. And there are people there who are dying from other diseases uh, other than Ebola, such as malaria and typhoid. Uh, and there's mothers who need to go to hospital to have their babies, and there aren't the hospitals necessary that can take them. So that's becoming, in a sense, as much of an issue as the Ebola crisis itself. And this is, again, a real good reminder why we should be heeding WHO and CDC advice to sort of ramp up this response and help get this outbreak in check because not because of the challenges there in Liberia which is where everybody's heart is but again every global problem is a local problem. Dr. Rod, do you know can that Again, as I, I mentioned, we're evaluating the possibility of using uh, serum from the uh, recovered patients. They would presumably have antibody formed against the virus, so we'd be able to use that preformed antibody and give it to our patients. So that is one possibility that's being evaluated. Well, so, um, for example, in some of the more primitive settings uh, where care is sometimes being delivered in some of the poorest parts of the world, they may not even have the capability of giving intravenous infusions. Sometimes they rely upon just oral rehydration therapy. Uh, they aren't able to give patients electrolyte uh, infusions. They can't give patients uh, medications that would support their blood pressure, let alone put them on a ventilator. So these are the kinds of things that we'll be able to do in this unit. Um, and again, I think, uh, you know, tries to shift the balance in favor of our patient. Doctor, based on your um, assessment from, you, from your colleagues, how important was this experimental drug ZMAT in the other two cases, and how concerned are you about not having it now? Yeah, so. Uh, you know, it's really impossible to say with such limited experience how effective this medication is. Um, I think that uh, many authorities believe that it's the medication that's the furthest along in development that shows promise. 
Um, clearly, it's been given to a number of folks. The two patients here in the United States uh, survived. I'm aware that it was, I believe, given to the uh, physician that went to Spain and died. So, um, you know, we, we hope that it's uh, uh, helpful. I know that they're working very hard to develop uh, additional doses. And as I mentioned, you know, this is an opportunity, uh, even though it's a big tragedy, for us to learn more about this disease and more effective ways to treat it. Um, clearly, we want to be uh, using these experimental drugs as, as a responsible manner as possible to learn the most that we can. And has the patient been, is he responsive? Is he Do you want to share with it? What I will share is uh, he is communicating with us. Thank you. Yeah, again, we're, we're evaluating our options at this point. That's about all I can say. The, the virus itself, does it remain dormant in the body? Is it, is there no chance of it coming back like a herpes virus? We'll come back, you know, periodically. Once it's gone, it's gone. Is that, is that, that the case? That's correct. Once somebody uh, survives uh, their illness, they're thought to be immune to uh, the disease. Uh, they will have antibody there that's present and should be protective. Um, the virus can remain in certain body fluids for some period of time, and so there is some concern that it could be in seminal fluid, for instance, uh, for a longer period of time. So uh, these are the things that, um, you know, populations need to be aware of and take precautions for. Uh, this is one of the worries in, in uh, um, Western Africa that you may have patients who survive and could potentially, for a short period of time, we're not talking years by any means, but for a number of weeks, could potentially have some infectious virus in various types of body fluids. But uh, once they survive, they're really immune and the virus does not hang out like a, uh, like a herpes virus, your example. It will not come back and remain latent uh, for long periods of time. Since Tom has brought, brought up herpes, that probably is an indication that we're about ready to wind things down. Uh, two, two or three... <laughs> Leave it to Becca to do that. Uh, two or three more questions, and then we'll uh, call it a day here. Yeah, on a personal level, uh, when I read Rick's email Monday morning, you can just tell by my emotions that. Uh, um, I had the same response Monday morning. Um, some tears, emotion, taking a deep breath, uh, realizing this, you know, uh, had the possibility, but it was Labor Day. I was trying to, you know, uh, relax and be able to restore myself. And, uh, and honestly, uh, it took the wind out of me. Uh, but at the same time, I have seen God's faithfulness with uh, Kent Brantley and with Nancy Reipel, uh, and, uh, and so my faith uh, held sure. Um, it was actually then Monday afternoon, I was standing in the line with my wife. Uh, we were buying an appliance and I was in the checkout line when I looked at my uh, text that he had tested positive. And, uh, and so Will and I and the rest of our leadership activated a rapid response team and the team has just responded uh, and uh, has really pulled together, uh, you know, on our side and then being able to see all of the different people that responded to be able to bring, uh, bring uh, Rick back has really encouraged our hearts. But even this morning when I saw Rick being transported into the hospital on the ambulance, I'm sitting there crying. Uh, but tears actually of gratitude um, that he was able to come back and uh, care for him and uh, trusting God for a good outcome and uh, trusting God to use uh, the good medical staff here, whatever treatments, God uses all means. And we're, uh, we're praying just as Jim, my new friend, uh, who served me breakfast this morning, uh, activated a whole prayer chain for Rick. You talked about Rick being kind of a humble guy, but can you talk a little bit more about what he's like? Yeah, I, I've known Rick since the year 2000 when we were both on the same SIM leadership course. And I've known him off and on uh, since then. I've been in Liberia for four years as the country director. And Rick has been in and out. Uh, and, but he's been in Liberia for upwards of 25 years. He was working 
all through the civil war that was there. He's been evacuated twice because of that uh, out of uh, Liberia. But he's a guy who loves the Liberian people. And just the, the team of uh, people that I work with in Liberia, not only the SI missionaries that are there, but also our Liberian colleagues are fantastic people who are dedicated to serving those that are around them and giving the glory to God. So I think for Rick, you know, as, as uh, Bruce has shared, you know, he's a humble guy and you know, he apologized <laughs> for what was happening. He wants to see the ministry of SIM continue there. We're at the, at the moment in partnership with Samaritan's Purse, we're building a new hospital there to replace the rather dilapidated one that we have. And, and as Dr. Kana said, the public health system in Liberia needs improvement, and that's part of what we're about, working with partners in order to be able to do that. And part of Rick's commitment is to go back, Lord willing, if he survives, to help to set up a residency program for training Liberian doctors. Uh, we want to improve the healthcare system in Liberia, uh, and that is urgently needed at the moment. Time for one last question. Yeah, so the, the basis for this is, again, somebody who's recovered from the infection would have antibody formed against the virus, and we would be using that passively. So in other words, giving that antibody to our patient. Uh, again, we're evaluating whether that's going to be possible, um, and that's really about all I can share with you at this point. Okay, that'll uh, wrap up things here this afternoon or this morning, whatever time it is. This will be our uh, final official briefing for today. We are still uh, in uh, d deciding mode whether we'll have something tomorrow, it's very likely we will. So um, stay tuned. I've, if you'd like to, to be added to the list of uh, folks who receive our emails, uh, send me an email, twilson at nebraskamed.com. You've been listening to the uh, first update of uh, Ebola patient Dr. Rick Saker at the Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, we heard uh, this morning that the, the transfer went very smoothly uh, from Offutt Air Force Base to the Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Mark Rupp, the infectious disease specialist, saying that he is sick but stable condition and he has been able to uh, communicate uh, with the doctors and staff. We have some new video also this morning. This is courtesy of the uh, Nebraska State Patrol from their copter. As you can see, uh, Dr. Uh, Saker being transported from that uh, private plane uh, into the hospital, into the uh, into the ambulance uh, on his way to the Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Rupp also saying that you know he is seriously ill uh, with the disease that has a high mortality rate and they are looking at the treatment options. And some of those treatment options, one of those treatment options of course the drug that they used on the other two Ebola patients that were treated in Atlanta called ZMAP. That drug, they ran out of that drug so now they're looking at options including um, using blood and antibodies from those two doctors that were successfully treated of their Ebola virus so that could take two to three weeks maybe longer just depending on the condition there of Dr. Rick Saker, which they gave very li limited information. They say he's sick, but he is stable and he is communicating with doctors. Of course, his family comes to Omaha tomorrow. We will continue to update this story on KETV.com, so continue to follow the updates there. Thanks for joining us, and we'll send it back to regular programming.